Hey managers of the Super Conference, this is your commissioner Tyler Burkhart here welcoming you to season three of our Fantasy Football League. Now I have to say that after last night, it was probably the most enjoyable draft I've done yet. And taking a look at the teams and analyzing each of the players that all the teams have assembled, I am convinced that this year will be the most competitive and challenging year yet. So make sure you're ready. Be ready for some awesome competition and keep that energy level high as we go through the year 2012. Now before I show you the rankings, I want to talk to you real quick as far as the method. Every year I try to do some kind of statistical analysis to show you, to prove to you, why one team is higher than the other. I did it again this year but a little different. What I ended up doing was I found the maximum point level for each position. For instance, last year, quarterback Aaron Rodgers scored almost 400 fantasy points. Meanwhile, at the running back position, Ray Rice scored close to 300. I did this for all the different positions, and then I shrunk the numbers down to actually numbers that I could at least play with and understand. So after doing all that, there's six different categories that I judged your team on. Quarterback on a scale of 1 to 9 your two running backs on a scale of 1 to 14, your two wide receivers on a scale of 1 to 12, your tight end and your flex on a scale of 1 to 10, your kicker and your defense on a scale of 1 to 10, and then bench and intangibles on a scale of 1 to 10. Now, what do I like about this? The first thing I really like is this is an equal or close to equal comparison or distribution of how the points are usually scored on the average team. The second thing that I really about, like about it is it shows the difference or the variance in talent level at each position. For instance, for quarterback, Seattle scored a 9 out of 9 because he's got Aaron Rodgers. Meanwhile, Los Angeles with Josh Freeman only scored a 5 out of 9 because, let's face it, Josh Freeman is not that talented. So therefore, it shows a good variance in that player talent level, uh, and it shows a good analysis of that. Also, I want to mention that the kicker defensive category are categories that don't have a great, as great of a variance. They're closer together. So even though it's on a scale of 1 to 10, because remember that 10 shows that distribution or that portion of your point level, all teams scored a 7 or higher. Because let's face it, the difference between kickers or defense is really not that great. That's why we don't pick them high. So therefore, keep that all of that in mind. Probably the last thing to mention is what is intangibles. That's a great question. Now for bench, you can score up to five points for your bench, one to five in that section, in that last category. But then on the other scale is one to five for your intangibles. And that takes into consideration how well you've done in previous years. Managers that have made it to the playoffs or that have won the league either received a 4 or a 5 for intangibles. If you haven't, you scored a 1, 2, or 3. I like this cat or this structure or this philosophy because it rewards managers that have done good in the past. Because let's face it, we're going to pick up a lot of people on free agencies. There's going to be injuries, so how do you react to that? And that's going to take all that into account. So that's why I added that feature to it, and it did switch the ranking somewhat which I think made it pretty interesting. All right, enough of the nonsense. Let's get to the rankings. At number 16, I have Kiln Legend. Now, a fun fact for you is last year, uh, is if you look at all the playoff teams last year, I got five out of the six correct. The only team that proved me wrong was Kiln Legend. So sure enough, if he wants to get to the playoffs again this year, he's going to have to do it. I like the fact that he has the Matthew Staff Stafford Kelvin Johnson combination. Obviously, it's one of the best combinations in fantasy football. However, he's got the worst running back tandem in Roy Hallou and Isaac Redman, which that running back tandem is probably your greatest consistency in fantasy football to get you to the top. Because it's poor, I have him on the bottom at number 16. And number 15, I have Oakland Velos. There's no doubt I love Tom Brady this year with his weapons, and I like Steven Jackson with Jeff Fisher this year. What I don't like is he has a tight end at the flex position, 
and an incredibly poor bench. Drafting Kenny Britt too does not help you at all for your consistency either, and it will be an up and down year for Oakland. At number 14, I have the Cleveland Shamans. Now for Cleveland, I think he's got one of the best receiving cores in Jordy Nelson and Brandon Moy. Once again, though, I do not like his running back tandem. Trent Richardson is an unproven rookie, and rookies never run for over 1,000 yards. He also has an injury issue heading into the regular season. Meanwhile, Jonathan Stewart will be splitting running or uh, carries with D'Angelo Williams and Mike Tolbert, and even maybe Cam Newton. So because of that situation, I don't like any, either of his running backs, which really dropped him back to number 14. Number 13 is San Antonio Toros. Now i got to say, other than Kiln Legend in Minnesota entering the draft because of where their draft positions were, they were in the worst case or worst situation to be in. The next team was San Antonio because of the situation with Ryan Matthews, which definitely did hurt his ranking. But he actually did a good job with his draft getting RG3, who I like a lot. And I also like the fact that he went for Fred Jackson in the first round, who I think will be a consistent force for him. So it'll be interesting to see how his team does. At number 12, I have Portland Car Ramrod. I love the fact he's got Arian Foster, and I love his receiving core with Roddy White and Demarius Thomas. What do I do? What I do not like is a he did not get the handcuff and Ben Tate, which I think is crucial with Arian Foster. And I don't like the fact that he's starting both Spiller and Hightower. Huge question marks entering the year as far as how many carries they get. I think Spiller has a great potential, but I wouldn't want to touch or plan on starting any of the running backs in Washington. At number 11, I have Los Angeles Seismic Quakes. Now after last year, finishing last, at least he's risen himself back up to 11, but he still has some work to go. I like his receiving core, probably one of the best in our league with Larry Fitzgerald, Reggie Wayne, Ended up um, with another great draft pick in Victor Cruz. But he's going to have some work as far as with some of the other positions. And a big upgrade that he needs to work on is that quarterback position with Josh Freeman. And number 10, I have Cream Bay Legends. Also faced with a difficult draft situation, I thought he handled it very well. He took DeMarco Murray, who if I had the number one pick, I would take. Because unlike Richardson, I've seen DeMarco Murray. I know he can perform at that elite level. I also really liked Richard Mendenhall. Remember, we're in a keeper league. If Mendenhall gets back to the status that he was at in the second half of this season, when he's back, to what he did two years ago, he's going to be an excellent keeper that Green Bay can have for three more years. Awesome pick. Surprised someone didn't do it sooner. I do not like the fact that he's starting both Demarius Moore and Michael Bush. Michael Bush at least will get the goal line carries, but with more talent there, but a huge injury-prone player. So he has two big question marks, high potential, high reward, but also could be toward the bottom if it doesn't pay off. And number nine, I have New York Blackout. Now there's different, or he did some good draft moves that I really like a lot. He made a crafty move to get Cam Newton, who now he can have four years on his team. I also like the fact he took Ben Jarvis Green Ellis, who will play for Cincinnati and will get definitely the bulk of the carries. However, I do not like the fact he's starting both Cedric Benson and Steven Ridley. I actually like Steven Ridley quite a bit and would be a great flex play because he will get goal line carries. However, Cedric Benson will at best probably get a share of the carries will never get goal line carries most likely cuz remember Green Bay still has John Kuhn that they like to use. And Green Bay just doesn't run the ball that much. So I think that's where he really needs to focus on his time is that flex position. Also, warning to the league, if Arian Foster gets hurt, expect New York Blackout to be a top 4 team. Why? He's got Ben Tate. That would take care of his flex position. All of a sudden he becomes a very dangerous team. And number eight is San Diego Wales, which is my most simple analysis of the league. He doesn't have any players that I am super in love with, but I don't hate anybody on his team either. 
really doesn't have any holes in his starting lineup. So because of that, it's a good average team. I have him at number eight. And number seven, I have the Seattle Sasquatches. One spot out of the playoffs. He's got three of the top 20 players of this year for fantasy in Aaron Rodgers, LaShawn McCoy, Rob Gronkowski. The bad news, the talent stops there. I don't want Danny Amendola. There's way too many receivers right now in St. Louis. I don't know what's going on. Robert Meacham still has chemistry issues with Phillip Rivers. And Shane Vereen, I don't know if he's going to get two carries or ten carries. I like the fact, though, his bench has a lot of upcoming and potential talent. So he could get into the top six easily if things work out in his favor. And number six, I have Minnesota Bryans. Definitely did a great job in the draft. Did a great job before the draft in getting Maurice Jones Drew. He's got the best running back tandem. That said and done, that should get him into the top six. As I said before, running back is so position or important in our league, and he's done a good job in making that a priority. However, he's got the worst receiving core, I think, in our league, and Malcolm Floyd and Mike Williams. If he wants to at least be in contention of winning our league, I think he's going to have to make drastic improvements there. And number five, I have Fargo and Bargo. Fargo, I loved his first-round draft pick with Doug Martin. I don't know why someone didn't take him sooner. Once again, we are in a keeper league. Remember, you could keep Doug Martin for this year, and it doesn't count as a contract year, and then have three years with Doug Martin. By year two and year three, he should be good. I like his future stock, and that was a good pick. Not to mention, he also got Antonio Gates and Antonio Brown. Also, two very high potential players. What I do not like, I don't like his bench. But fortunate for him, they don't play that often. And I don't like Jay Cutler. That's another story. And number four, we have San Fran Frenzy. Probably the best pick of the draft, I thought, with Matt Ryan. He took him a little bit higher than normal, but he has amazing potential this year to put up fantastic stats and to be a keeper for the future for him. Also, if there's one running back I do want for Washington, it is Evan Royster because I think they want him to be the guy in Washington. However, the bad news with him is he's got a huge injury-prone team in Darren McFadden and Andre Johnson. We'll find out what happens this season with San Fran. And number three, I have the New York Yankees, who made a huge jump entering this year. Chris Johnson was a huge trade that he got last year to help him out with this year. But then he also made good draft picks with Julio Jones, Donald Brown, and Peyton Hillis in the third round, who's going to share the carries in Kansas City, who runs the ball a lot, and he's going to get goal line carries. Awesome job. The only thing I don't like is Carson Palmer. Some days he'll score 20 fantasy points, and others he'll have two because he throws three interceptions. Risky pick there, but it could pay off in the end because he does have good weapons. And number two, I have the Washington Stimulus. Like I said, I'm biased, but I love the three running back system. Sean Green will have 1,200 total yards between rushing and, and receiving and six touchdowns. Name me another flex in our league that will do that. I don't know. The question mark here is Andrew Luck. If he does somewhat decent and becomes a top 12 quarterback, I should be at the top. If he isn't, I'll probably be a bust and be toward the middle or even toward about the 10th position. Huge risk, but as we said, if you want to win this league, you got to take some of those risks and hope they pay off. But the number one team entering week one, I think, is Indianapolis Eyeball. He hit every draft pick right other than Mark Ingram. I love his depth. He picked players that have upcoming talent. A.J. Green, Eric Decker, Ryan Williams. Tony, well, Tony Romo is just solid all around. But then you got Ray Rice and Jimmy Graham as keepers. He's going to have a really tough decision next year as far as who he wants to keep. And he's losing Ray Rice. Mark my words. If you have a player that is in year three of his contract, watch what Indianapolis Eyeball did this year and copy what he did for future years. Awesome job. That concludes my rankings. I hope you enjoy, and I encourage you to make videos and do your own rankings as well.
game on.